It's time for the Phil Ferguson Show. This is Phil Ferguson, and you are listening to the cleverly titled The Phil Ferguson Show. I am so delighted you could join us today. This is show number 370. Uh, In case you missed it, I actually had a show 369 and a half. Uh, That is available over at patreon.com, only available to patrons. So you'd have to sign up and kick in a dollar or more per episode if you'd like to. And you can get that information. Uh, That was mostly about my thoughts on market allocations for calendar year 2021. I will eventually include all that information here, uh, but I figured it's nice to give clients information first because they're paying me. And then maybe patrons every once in a while give them information first because they're contributing. And then everything is here for free. You just might have to wait a little bit. I, I think that's fair. So this show is another one of those opposite shows, I guess. We had uh, last full episode was all uh, finance topics that I was talking about, and it's still going to be mostly finance, but uh, there's two different interviews. So we have two interviews. We have uh, John McNair, who has been on the show before to talk about trusts, and we talk about some of the new rules in the last year or so and why you might want to have a trust and how a trust works. If you know everything about trusts, Maybe it bores you. I apologize. But maybe you learn something I think I do every single time we do one of those episodes. And also, in this episode, another guest that we've had on before is Helene Olin. And we talk about kind of current affairs with uh, the stock market. We do touch on GameStop a little bit. But we talk about uh, Katie Porter uh, in, in Congress being removed or not being put back on uh, financial committee. I, oh my God, I'm going to mess this up here. What is that committee called? It is, uh, here it is. Ah, the uh, Financial Services Committee. I think she's a valuable asset to that, but there's weird rules that apparently she didn't make the cut. And if I learn more about that, uh, we also talk about uh, Elizabeth Warren's 2% wealth tax. Uh, if I have that correct, uh, her proposal is that people that have more than $50 million of assets should cough up 2% of all of those assets every year and give it to the government. And of course, if I say it that way, it almost sounds like I'm against it, but I'm all for it. Um, Helene and I also talk about possible uh, tax for trading. Um, I don't know if it'd be a penny, but it might be 0.2 cents or 0.01% per share to trade stocks. And for the average person, when you're buying and selling stock, it might add pennies or maybe a dollar on a big share quantity purchase, but it could really put the brakes on a lot of the huge rapid trading uh, done by people and or computers that add instability to the market. So a lot, a lot of good stuff. So uh, hang tight. We'll take our quick little break and then we're going to talk about trusts and uh, updates on current affairs in, uh, in the investing world. I like how you call homosexuality an abomination. I don't say homosexuality is an abomination, Mr. President. The Bible does. Yes, it does. Leviticus. 18.22. Chapter and verse. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions while I had you here. I'm interested in selling my youngest daughter into slavery, as sanctioned in Exodus 21.7. She's a Georgetown sophomore, speaks fluent Italian, always cleared the table when it was her turn. What would a good price for her be? While thinking about that, can I ask another? My chief of staff, Leo McGarry, insists on working on the Sabbath. Exodus 35, 2 clearly says he should be put to death. Am I morally obligated to kill him myself, or is it okay to call the police? 
Here's one that's really important, because we've got a lot of sports fans in this town. Touching the skin of a dead pig makes one unclean. Leviticus 11.7. If they promise to wear gloves, can the Washington Redskins still play football? Can Notre Dame? Can West Point? Does the whole town really have to be together to stone my brother John for planting different crops side by side? Can I burn my mother in a small family gathering for wearing garments made from two different threads? Think about those questions, would you? One last thing. Well, you may be mistaking this for your monthly meeting of the ignorant, tight-ass club. In this building, when the president stands, nobody sits. You're listening to The Bill Ferguson Show. Next up, we have John McNair, who is an elder law attorney and a specialist in trusts and estate planning and things like that. And, of course, if I have any of that wrong, John, you can correct me. Uh, How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. Did I I have that description pretty, pretty right? Well, you can call me an estate planning attorney that does elder law, or you can do me an, call me an elder law attorney who does estate planning, because I really do both. So. Excellent, excellent. And of course, uh, one of the important distinctions, uh, you are in the state of Texas. I am. And a lot of laws uh, relating to the concepts you're talking about vary by state, is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Excellent. So hopefully... The intent is that this uh, podcast is helpful for people, but keep in mind that if you are not in the state of Texas, any specific details may not imply, uh, imply, apply. Uh, And John, you are an attorney in Texas, correct? I am. And I am not. I am am not an attorney in Texas or any state, so my opinions should have less value to your ear than, than John's when it comes to specific legal issues, especially... If you live in Texas, Uh, of course, check with your own legal and tax professionals before you do anything that we might suggest as a good idea. Double check because it's your money. And John, I don't know about you, but I'm not paying someone's tax bill if they fuck something up. How about you? (laughs) No, that's a no. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) So we hope to be informative, educational, and if possible, mildly entertaining. So, uh, John, it's been a while since you've been on the show, but... I get a lot of emails from people that like when you are on the show. So I figured, why not? Let's party again. What's what's new in your world? How is Texas treating you? Oh, Texas is great. It's uh, it's hanging in there, despite <laughs> uh, what's <laughs> been happening to everybody the last year. We're hanging in there. Yeah, I, I know. And in reference specifically to new known cases of COVID, Illinois uh, had an elevated uh, status a few months ago. We were having 15, 20,000, I think, new cases a day. Some new rules got added and implemented, and we're down to three to 4,000 a day. So, yay us. Yeah, that's good. That, that is good. Maybe maybe spring, maybe summer, we'll, we'll all be partying like, like the good old days. Um, one of the things I want to make sure that we cover um, in relationship to trusts and specifically trusts for someone that might be listening to the show and you know have some money. Uh, there was a new rule, new law, was it the SECURE Act last year? Um, right. How might that fuck things up if people aren't aware? So the SECURE Act changed the way that inherited retirement accounts are taxed for income tax purposes. Prior to January 1 of 2020, if I named my daughter, uh, Sarah, as my beneficiary of my IRA, and uh, she inherited it, and I died and she inherited it, she could pull the money out of that um, IRA over a period of time. And that period of time was her actuarial life expectancy calculated at the time of my death. So since she's only 23, that would have been a very long time, and she could pull out very small amounts over a long period of time, her required minimum distributions, therefore being allowed to leave the bulk of it inside the retirement account, the IRA, which is a good thing because it accumulates income tax-free within the retirement account, the IRA. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, and, oh, one one caveat. I'll, I'll jump in. I'm so sorry. One caveat. I would say it'll grow tax deferred, um, 
uh, tax deferred yeah. until you have to start taking it out when you reach <clears throat> the age uh, when you are required to start taking requirement of distribution. Well, yeah, let me back up. It's not tax deferred for an inherited IRA because you begin your requirement of distributions immediately. They're just deferred over a very, very, very long time. A- absolutely. They are deferred over a very long time. And in the example of your daughter, I, I don't know if it's real or not, but let's go with it. Uh, someone who's 23 might have a life expectancy greater than 50 years, according to that actuarial table from the IRS that you mentioned. And if that's the case, um, when one figures out what is required, and these, of course, are the old rules, just to be clear for everybody, mm-hmm. let's say your life expectancy is 50 the amount you have to take out is one divided by 50 or give or take about 2% of what that specific portfolio or account was worth as of 1231 of at the end of the previous year. So 2% withdrawal rate, you can do that for a long time, <laughs> assuming exactly. the account grows at 4 Which or 5%. Which the rules were so uh, favorable to taxpayers uh, before the SECURE Act was uh, passed, and that's why Congress decided to change it because they wanted more revenue. They, they so definitely they did. <laughs> they're definitely going to get more revenue. Uh, so, what is the gist of the new rule for someone you in this case? And let's pretend that you have exactly one million dollars. Uh, you give this one million dollars to your daughter. What does she have to do with it now? So now, her period of time to take it out is ten years. She can take it out. Oh, let me back up. There's a one-year period after I die when we determine who my beneficiary is. Let's say that it's a trust, right? And I name a a revocable. Well, I, I name a trust for her that I have created in my revocable trust. The trust for her obviously becomes irrevocable after I die because I can't revoke it anymore. Right. I'm the grantor, and I can't. Re- Revoke it or amend it or alter it anymore because I'm dead. That would be so a good trick. It becomes irrevocable. Right. We have the IRS rules allow us a year to figure out what that irrevocable trust is and who the primary beneficiary is because the primary beneficiary is the quote measuring life, the one who we determine is going to be measured under the old rules for that long payout or in this case for that ten year payout. And so she can take all of it out in the first year. She can take out one-tenth of it over the uh, succeeding 10 years, or she can take it all out in the 10th year, or I guess technically 11th year because we've gotten that one-year right. wait and then 10 years after that. So by the end of that anniversary date, she's got to have, had, she's got to have taken it all out. So every time it's taken out... It is considered ordinary income for taxation. So she's going to be taxed on it over a shorter, much shorter period of time. Uh, and that's just the way the rule is now. And, and of course, the, the other thing that's really weird in a twist of logic, and I don't know if this was intended or not, but if that IRA goes to a trust and the trust owns that and, and it gets named as a beneficiary IRA for the trust, if the trustee, the person in charge of running that trust, uh, sees that there's rules within the trust language that says they can only take out the required minimum distribution for the benefit of your daughter, they might be bound up in a position because the first nine of those 10 years, there is actually no amount that's required. And they could interpret that, I think correctly, that the amount that they can take out is zero And it grows, which is great, but all of it comes out in the 10th year all at once, which could create a bigger than desired tax bill. Does that make sense? That does. And what you're referring to is um, a trust uh, um, drafting technique that was used under the old rules. Right. Under the old rules, the IRS said, well... If it's a trust, who's, who's going to be the measuring life? We're we're confused. There's so many beneficiaries potentially here. There's the child, there's the child, there's the child's children, uh, there's the child's grandchildren. So, who's the measuring life? Well, one way in the old days to draft to make sure that we had 
a measuring life that the IRS could clearly see is to say there are mandatory distributions to my daughter, Sarah McNair, beginning one year after my death and continuing on until, no, oh, for whatever, until the until the IRA is no more. Right. Uh, that was called a conduit trust. And I did a lot of conduit trust because it was made it easier for the IRS to identify the, quote, measuring line. Right. However, conduit trusts make no sense whatsoever. And as you say, they're a bad proposition after the SECURE Act. So and- now, all most attorneys, I know some attorneys that will decide, depending on the circumstances, they'll toggle between the two. But I frankly only draft them now as accumulation trust. Right. A trust which says the trustee is allowed to receive the requirement of a distribution and either distribute it or not in their discretion for the health support and maintenance of that beneficiary. And so, so it, in this case you don't you don't run into that problem that you yeah. posited. <laughs> Absolutely. And and I've even thought of more caveats. Uh, one of course if you have a trust document that was written up m- before January 1st of 2020, you probably should visit with your attorney and make sure you don't have these unexpected problems that could blow up after you're dead. I mean, it doesn't really affect the the decedent, but, but it might affect the people that you are trying to help in a way that you had not anticipated. Um, the other one, just to make sure, uh, there are some exceptions to this new 10-year rule. Uh, do you happen to know what those are? Yes. Uh, and some of them can be very helpful, I think, uh, in particular situations. So one of them is if you name a beneficiary who is no more than 10 years younger than you. Uh, and that would typically be like a sibling, perhaps. It wouldn't be your spouse because your spouse has a different rule. They can take the right. IRA, make it their own, and use their own life as the measure in life. So they don't really apply. It would be a non-spouse typically that you name who's 10 years less than no more than 10 years younger than you. Yeah. It's, you got to word it just right. It's, it's uh, important. Um, and right. so that, so that could be one strategy, but let's go back to, uh, the story you started with. Cause I like this one. You're leaving it to your descendant, your, your child. Um, and you don't want them to have it maybe because they don't know necessarily what to do with it. So you want to have a little control from the grave and you put it into a trust um, and that money has to come out. What kind of taxes does a trust pay, if any? He know, he asks so knowingly. A trust, trust like this uh, is what is called for income tax purposes a complex trust as opposed to a grantor trust. A grantor trust, if I create a trust for myself during lifetime where I can receive all the income, I get all the income taxation, whether I take the income or not, out of the trust. Real simple. If it's a complex trust, it depends on what happens to the income. If it stays in the trust and the trustee never distributes it to the child beneficiary during their, during that particular tax year, then it's taxed to the trust. And if they do distribute it to the child, then it's taxed to the child. Trusts have uh, higher effective income tax rates than individuals. So usually it makes more sense to make distributions to the child. But again, if you're dealing with minor or immature children, you may not want to to make direct distributions. You might want to pay for goods and services for them, which would be treated as a distribution. But that is the, the best thing that the drafter can do is create the flexibility for the trustee to make those income tax decisions about where's the best place for that income to be taxed, in the trust or to the beneficiary. Do I distribute the income or don't I? Absolutely. And I'm looking at, I pulled up a a web article that's brand new. So hopefully this is right. But if you know something better than me, just, you know, jump in. Uh, it says here that if a trust, and a, we're going to assume that it's the complex trust that, that you're talking about, an irrevocable trust, has taxable income over 
13000 not 130 just $13,000, that everything above that amount could face federal income tax of 37%. Is that correct? Wow. The, so a trust has the same brackets as individuals, but they're compressed. Oh, yeah. That's, they, that's pretty they, small, thirteen grand. <laughs> uh, and I don't keep up with this, but an individual will get to the 37% bracket with much more income than that, as I recall. Correct? That That is correct. And since we're doing that, let me pull up the 2021 tax brackets. Uh, of course, anyone can do this on a computer. Uh, let's see. This is from taxfoundation.org. And it says, filing tax brackets, as an example, uh, for married filing joint returns, you only start paying 37% as your marginal rate uh, for the amounts above $628,300 for calendar year 2021. So so there's a little bit of difference between <laughs> $13,000 and $600,000 of income. A- absolutely. So if this trust, however, however it did this, when we can get into those details, but if the trust generated $20,000 of taxable income. Let's say it's, again, a million-dollar trust that has 2% in dividends. It creates $20,000, and let's assume that's all taxable because that even that, what I just said, gets complicated. But for a minute, uh, $20,000, all of it, if it stays in the trust, it does not distribute that to the beneficiary in any way. A good chunk of that is going to get taxed at 24, 35, and then 37%. Whereas if the beneficiary receives those monies, assuming they meet all of the conditions and tax for tax law and for trust rules, um, that amount would be a 10% tax rate up to $19,900. That's a big difference. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so that yeah. that's, that's important stuff. And, and if you have an older trust, the definitions and rules for how one dispenses money may not properly take that into account. So again, another yeah, reason to check. You just really need to talk with your advisor and really bear down on whether it, you have conduit trust language in your in your documents, and maybe perhaps that's not the best way to go forward. Yeah, and the other thing that's really weird, and I haven't I, I haven't worked up a formula for this yet. I keep thinking about it, but. Uh, one of the things you said is you could take out 10% of the portfolio each year. Uh, and again, if it's a million dollars, does that mean in the first year it's easy, it's $100,000. But in the second year, if the trust says take out 10%, 10% of what? 10% of the year in value? Well, let's assume it's 900000 and it grew by 5%. So now it's 945000 Do you now take out 10% of that, which is 90000 yeah, 90450 Or do you take 10% out of the original value of a million? Uh, or do you just take out 100000 again? Because I, I don't know. So it, it should probably be. You would never clear. draft a trust. You would never draft a trust to say it should take out 10% every year. You would just give the discretion to the, to the trustee to make ah. that determination. And then you as a financial advisor would work with them and y'all would make a decision. How much should we take out each year until we get (laughs) knowing that we're going to ultimately get down to, and I'm talking about taking it out of the retirement account and put it into the trust or giving it to the beneficiary. Right. So, Uh, and of course you do with it in the trust is a different question, but if you're going to do that 10% then you as a financial advisor and the attorney and the client, get together and figure out, okay, this is the schedule we're going to work on to get us down to zero in the retirement account as of the end of the 10 years. Yeah, because the one thing I know that's probably not best, although there can be situations, which is why the language for uh, discretion, um, if someone gets a million dollars and takes that all out at once and counts it as their income for that year, they will pay 37% uh, tax Mm -hmm. on a good chunk of it, which they might be able to avoid just by taking out, and let's just say 10% per year, uh, where that 10% might be 100000 and now you're looking at a 22% uh, marginal tax bracket. So there's a, there's a big difference there. Right. Or you might have a, a, a wealthy, closely held business owner who's got a lot of uh, 
loss income that he can report on his individual return, and this might be a particularly good year to take that income because he's got losses to offset it. So, oh yes, Th- might- this is this is where I often get in trouble because people ask me what they think is a simple question, and I have to start with it depends. <laughs> It depends. It, it, it depends. Your particular financial situation is way different from everybody else. Yeah, yeah. So that that is important. Uh, I think one thing that we've t- touched on before, but maybe we didn't go uh, deep enough into it, and if we did, just uh, remind me, uh, trust, special needs trusts. Uh, you got any thoughts on those? Right. So um, we were talking about the exceptions to the... 10-year rule right. in the SECURE Act, and this brings into play a special needs trust because there are two categories of incapacitated individuals or trust for incapacitated individuals would qualify as well uh, that are allowed to stretch out over the course of the life of that incapacitated individual. So. Uh, you'll want to talk with your attorney about that, but you could potentially continue to stretch retirement accounts when paid out to special needs trust, uh, depending on <clears throat> the disability status of that particular uh, beneficiary. Uh, so, oh, and one other thing, there is one uh, other yeah. category of exceptions, which is kind of odd the way it's worded. Minor children are subject to stretching. You can stretch over the life expectancy of a minor child until they're not a minor anymore. (laughs) (laughs) So you can have a slower requirement on distribution to a minor until they reach, let's say, 18 or 21, depending on your state, and then they have to take it over the next 10 years. So if you did that, of course... You're not going to give the money directly to a minor. You're either going to have to decide to give it to a trust for the minor and make sure you have accumulation trust language, which makes it appropriately uh, eligible to be a beneficiary under IRS rules or a custodial account for that minor beneficiary. But you could stretch it out a little bit for minor beneficiaries. Yeah, and and I'm assuming that if a IRA gets rolled over to a beneficiary IRA owned by the trust, the trustee could, under certain circumstances, assuming they have the discretion to do so, they could pull everything out and pay the tax on that for whatever reason uh, and then invest it in something that's more tax efficient going forward and maybe, theoretically, end up having a lower net tax total over someone's lifetime. Does that sound like that that could work? That's right. Now... Keep in mind that we're ta- we, all we've talked about so far are tax laws. Yeah. <laughs> we do have this whole other set of laws regarding trust, and trustees have a fiduciary duty to the beneficiary, and that minor child probably has parents, and the trustees probably the parent themselves. But keep in mind there are third-party eyes out there that might say, well, that's a breach of fiduciary duty if you're taking – making – all of that income subject to taxation, you just got to document why that's actually a great strategy. You've just got to document the financial planning reasons why y'all why you did that, and keep that documentation around in case somebody perhaps threatens a suit against the trustee for breaching fiduciary duty for accelerating income taxation. Yeah, that that's good good suggestions because I I can think in my head there's possible scenarios where you just bite the bullet, pay the thirty seven percent tax on virtually everything, take it out, and then invest it in very high efficiency uh, index funds because the vast majority of taxes on that amount going forward under current rules would be capital gains, and those gains if they're low enough could be zero or fifteen percent. Of course, they can be higher 20 or 23.8, but you might pay a higher tax up front, but then only 15% on gains after that, whereas if you delayed the money in the IRA, you would pay 37% on the bigger amount 10 years later. Yeah, I agree. There's absolutely no reason why that can't be a justified strategy yeah. 
you just have to have all the documentation <laughs> around to explain why that was a good strategy. It's not dissimilar to the decision that uh, IRA owners themselves make when they decide, uh, should I convert to a Roth yeah. or not? A- absolutely. And of course, there's there's a the possibility you could just give away some money year after year after year and uh, you know those different things. Uh, yeah, let me mention one other yes. thing just as a, to throw all of the discussions that have been out there in the planning world about these. There is one other strategy that has been bandied about. I, I don't know. I haven't had any clients that were really prospects for this, and I think it's going to be a limited universe of clients, but there is a... a estate planning animal out there called a charitable remainder trust. And what happens in a charitable remainder trust is that if you make distribution, you make a contribution of money to that trust, that contribution is not immediately taxed. Now, you have to take uh, distributions to the beneficiary out over a period of time uh, but uh, that period of time um, could be longer than 10 years. Right. Uh, and, of course, at the end you have to have a, a charity as a remainder beneficiary. So you could name a charitable remainder trust as a beneficiary of the IRA and theoretically um, stretch out the payments over a longer period of time because the initial dumping of the IRA into the charitable remainder trust isn't a taxable event, but then you've got scheduled required distributions out of that trust over a period of time. One of the problems with that is the charitable remainder trust isn't valid if the life expectancy, if you named the distribution to be over the life of some individual if that life expectancy was too long. In the case of my daughter um, being 23 under the IRS tables, it would almost certainly be determined to be too long and it wouldn't be valid. Now, you can uh, set it to go for 20 years and 20 years is not gonna violate those rules. So you could at least double the distribution period of time rather than just 10 years you could make it 20 but again there's not a huge universe of clients that are going to want to do that most clients want their uh, children to benefit to the greatest extent possible don't really want a charity involved but it's an idea that's been bandied about so i thought i'd throw that out I, there i like that i was not aware of that so see i even learned things from my show uh for that charitable remainder trust, you, you mentioned 50 plus years is too much and 10 or 20 would probably float through. Is is there a firm line or is that state by state? How does so, that? So how it works is, let's say I die and I um, set up a charitable remainder trust with my daughter who's only 23 as the, bene- the lifetime beneficiary of that trust with her death remainder to the charity of my choice. The IRS rule is that if, actuarially speaking, the value of that trust will be less than 10% of what's contributed at the end, 10% of what was originally contributed, Uh or less, then it's not actuarially sound and we won't consider it a valid charitable remainder trust. Well, she's so... um, young, the IRS tables for the value of the lifetime interest swallow up the entire, almost the entire value of the trust. The remainder interest going to charity is considered such a small actuarial amount. What they're saying, it really is, you don't really have any charitable intent at all in this. You're just trying (laughs) to use this as a way to stretch I, to pay you a lot of less income tax. That makes a lot of sense. I am surprised that it only has to mean 10% of its original value. That that still seems like a giant uh, uh, loophole I can drive through. Right. Well, it just depends on the, the age of the, the 
the children. I mean, right. I've got a lot of elderly clients who's got um, children who are in their 50s and 60s. And so, you know, you might be able to work it with kids like that. But those are the rules. And so some people might be interested in looking into that. Um, again, I think it's going to be a fairly limited universe of clients, but it's out there. Well, what, what if I created a charitable remainder trust for a child who's 23, and let's just go with that example, and the trustee is obligated to give them 4% per year, and through wise investing, the trust makes 4% or more per year, could one do that in perpetuity because the trust value would always be the same, and then it at the end of the recipient's life, the trust that is no, still... No, no. So you have to calculate their actuarial value at the beginning, and and it's either going to... Whatever you set that out, I mean, they have... A, they can calc... The actuarial tables will tell you what the value of the life um, interest is, and it's going to be so much. It's... The life interest will eat up the trust, basically. Okay. There won't be enough value to get to the charity. Fair enough. So if you are even considering that, of course, get an actual tax professional, not Phil, uh, to make double sure that you're not doing something that uh, you're going to regret even after you're dead. Uh, so, right. So that that There's is good. software that tax attorneys use to make those calculations. <laughs> I, I like it. Um, who should make a trust? Uh, anybody, everybody, is there a certain amount of assets that you think about? It depends on the types of assets. Where's your head on this? So there are a lot of different trusts used for a lot of different purposes. I'm going to assume that you're talking about somebody who is thinking about a trust as their primary estate planning vehicle, a revocable trust. A revocable yes. trust has several advantages over using a will as your primary estate planning vehicle. In my opinion, the primary benefit is that a revocable trust does a better job of providing uh, management of your assets if you become incapacitated. And the reason for that is that if you become incapacitated and you're relying solely on a will for your death time transfers, you're going to have to rely on a power of attorney given to somebody uh, that you trust to handle financial affairs for you. And no offense to all of the fine financial firms that you deal with, Phil, <laughs> but some of those in financial institutions can be very difficult when an agent shows up, uh, I was going to say shows up in the lobby, but that's not happening right now. At some point in the future, they, it will happen again. and says, hey, mom's had a stroke, and I need to take over her accounts. Very mu Thank you very much. And here's her power of attorney. And the financial institution has uh, a loss, a legal section that's back in New York City and they've got all these rules and they don't like the way the power of attorney looks and they say, nah, we don't think so. Why don't you go get a guardianship of your mom and then come back to us? Well, a guardianship is a disaster. You never want to be in a guardianship. So I've always been concerned about relying solely on a power of attorney, whereas this, the same financial institution knows about the um, revocable trust in advance, it owns the fi those financial assets, and then uh, you become incapacitated. They, they just seem to be more amenable to working with that successor trustee. It's just been my experience and the experience of a lot of attorneys that that's a better deal. Yeah. And I live in a state where the probate process is very, very easy. Now, you have listeners from many different states, and I don't know what it's like in other states. I know there are some states where I understand, like California, that it is very onerous. And if your assets are owned by irrevocable trust, you can avoid probate. That's not such a big deal in Texas. It might be in other states. 
Yeah, I, I had so, the luxury. I had the luxury of avoiding ahead. probate at all because all of the m- meaningful, significant assets that my parents had were either in an IRA, and we were able to enjoy mm-hmm. the old rules, or mm-hmm. uh, were titled to uh, the trust. And so I just showed up with all the documents, uh, death certificates, a uh, copy of the trust, and poof, I was now in charge of that trust and could follow the rules inside of that trust to, dis- to distribute the money. So right. that so made it real easy. you avoided a lot of, oh, geez. not necessarily a huge amount of expense and, and time consumption, but perhaps, depending on um, your particular state's probate process. Absolutely. And I, I see on the... The uh, time here that we we've been doing a wonderful job talking for a long time. Are there any other topics that you have in mind that we should cover today before we wrap up? The Secure Act was probably the one that I thought most affected your listeners on estate planning these days. Excellent. In case I have a listener in Texas, how can they find you? Uh, so the uh, they can send me an email, J McNair at McNair hyphen dallaslaw.com they can go to my website www.mcnair hyphen dallaslaw.com or they can call me 469-210-8371 there you go everybody have it if you if you live in texas like a lot of my listeners do uh, this is a possible option for you but of course most listeners probably don't live in texas so you have to find your own person in your state John, thank you so much for your time. I always appreciate you being here on the Phil Ferguson Show to help us understand a little bit more about trusts. Thank you. I appreciate your time. I don't think you have to be a religious person to have good values. So... The way I see this is I'm going to start where you started, and that is I believe everyone should be treated with respect. As I said, for me, it is a basic value. Every human being has value, and that means every human being should be treated with respect. And that's true whether we're talking about black or white, straight or gay or trans, uh, whether we're talking about old or young, I think this is really an important part of who we are. And if I can, let me just pick up one. Although you mentioned several, but I think maybe it, it may be the one since you mentioned it first. is the question about abortion. Um, I understand that you and I may have differences. There may be a lot of different views in this room. But here's what I'm certain about. And that is a woman who's in the position of trying to decide what she's going to do about a pregnancy that she may not have planned for, may not have hoped for, may have been forced upon her, is a woman who should be able to call on anyone for help. She should be able to call on her partner. She should be able to call on her mom. She should be able to call on her priest or her rabbi or her pastor. But the one entity that should not be in the center of that very hard decision is the federal government. That's how I see it. The Phil Ferguson Show is for educational purposes only. Nothing said on the show should be interpreted as personalized investment advice. Your investments should be based on your situation, and you should consult with your financial advisor before taking any action. The show may contain ads. These ads are placed into the show by the hosting company after I finish recording and editing. I have little control over the content of the ads, and you should not assume that I support their products or claims. If you choose to support the show via the new Patreon page, that support does not create an advisor-client relationship. You're listening to the Bill Ferguson show. All right, everybody, as promised, I have Helene Olin and she is an author, two delightful books. One is called Pound Foolish. The other one is The Index Card. It's all about uh, how you can do a lot of good investing pretty darn easily. 
In the past, she has written for places like Salon, New York Times, The Atlantic, Forbes, Slate, Bloomberg Network, Reuters. And now, Helena, if I have this correctly, uh, you primarily or only do The Post, is that? I'm at The Washington Post twice a week. Excellent, excellent. And, of course, you have some new fun articles that re-piqued my interest because of some current events. And I thought, oh, my God, she was on like six, seven months ago. I don't want to do that already. But you know what? Uh, it seemed like such a good match to talk to you again and given the topics and what you've written on. Um, so welcome to the show. Thank you for having me back on. It, it, it is it is great fun. Of course, everybody, if you want uh, some books other than my recommended reading list, of course, I, uh, Helene, you don't know this, but I have four books that I tell everyone to read about investing. Um, if you want something on top of those four, these two would be very, very high on my alternate list. So uh, I highly recommend them. Well, thank you. <laughs> now, all, all you need to do is have someone make a movie of one of your books and you can coast easy. <laughs> oh, I wish, right? <laughs> uh, a boring movie, though. Invested index funds. Invested index funds. <laughs> Invested index funds. <laughs> well, uh, they can do like they did with the big short and, and have people in uh, bathtubs uh, with bubbles on come and tell you about the boring stuff just to make it pop. Well, we definitely have put the uh, GameStop shenanigans out of oh. business this week or last week. Well, that, that's for sure. Yeah, so that's definitely one of the topics I wanted to cover. And since you brought it up before me, which is amazing, considering how much I'm talking about it lately and people are getting kind of tired of me, let's talk to you about GameStop. And they've already heard me talk about it, but how did this happen? Why is it happening? And what's next? Oh, those are all really good questions oh, you're that too are kind. Like, almost impossible to answer. Uh, <laughs> that's what I really thought. Knows why this is happening. That's, that's why I'm asking uh, you. <laughs> why GameStop is going to be one of those fascinating co- uh, questions of all time, I think. Yeah. Essentially, what is happening is um, a number of GameStop, as we know, is um, a, what is called a fading retailer. It uh, sells, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, games. Um, which is something that has mostly moved online. Right. Uh, it is in a mall uh, or in you know shopping centers or whatever. This is not like a good business model. Uh, it usually has a tendency to turn up on lists of you know expected retail apocalypse lists. Do you see those? Yeah. Um, but in any case, and no surprise, a number of hedge funds um, shorted the stock, thinking it's going to fall even further. Um, some people beg to differ. Some of those people were other hedge funds. Some of those people were individual traders on sites like Reddit's Wall Street Bets board. And essentially what happened is the stock opened the year at about 18 and change. The uh, A few days later, I think around January 10th or so, the um, it was announced that the uh, founder of Chewy.com was joining the board of of GameStop. This was taken by some individual investors as a sign that everything was going to be great and amazing. And hey, maybe that's possible. He did, you know, for right. Chewy.com did very well. Sure. Uh, but as we all know, just because you're successful once doesn't mean you're successful again. And the stock at that point seem to become overtaken by a mania is the only way to quite describe this. And within a matter of days, the stock had gone from 18 and change to about 100 to about 300 something. In various times of day trading, it would hit about 500. Uh, Young men on these Reddit boards and on YouTube and on Discord and a few other places start piling in buying options on Reddit. Keep in mind, I mean, on uh, Robinhood. Keep in mind, Robinhood is, um, you know, cost free trading because they're making their money selling the (laughs) orders. Yep. And in any case, this becomes a whole brouhaha in which one side is claiming that they are taking on Wall Street. Um, One hedge fund, uh, Melvin Capital, does indeed run itself into some trouble. Um, This is where it helps to have rich friends. They promptly get bailed out by uh, a couple of other really wealthy hedge funds. And the stock, uh, eventually what happens is as Robinhood suddenly stops trading in stock. 
um, and all sorts of anger and conspiracy theories come up. But what is, you know, that, you know, various Wall Street interests made them do it, blah, blah, blah. This creates all sorts of strange bedfellows like AOC, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez right. and Ted Cruz find themselves on the same side saying this is a disgrace. How could this happen? They're being harming individual investors. Arguably, Robin Hood did the only responsible thing in the entire saga, though not for the reasons you would think. As it turns out, what was happening is the clearinghouses were out, were so concerned about what was going on, they were asking Robin Hood to put up more money, and Robin Hood didn't have the money, so they had to stop the trading. And anyway, this has become um, Robin Hood eventually reopened trading in some limited fashion. Um, but at that point, that seems to have burst the mania finally. I believe the stock is now trading around 100, yeah. and a whole lot of people are about to lose their shirts if they haven't lost it already. Yeah, and is that a good summation of what happened? <laughs> it's it's delightful, and one of the things I want to point out that you touched on, just to make sure that it's perfectly clear. If you think I have this wrong, correct me, of course. Um, that when people talk about the money being lost, it seems they seem to think that it's only a couple of hedge funds that lost money, and they ignore every other investor of any other type, uh, whether it's a mutual fund, a managed mutual fund, individual investors. There were all kinds of other people that were also short that ran the risk of getting squeezed out. It's not just affecting the hedge funds. Right. And the other thing that happened is, is that, you know, this this sort of mass panic took hold. Um, and, you know, the the sides that, you know, the the individual traders were sort of like, oh, my God, you know, Wall Street now knows we're on to them. But from what I could tell, what the panic was really over was the fact that this is the sort of thing that generally happens in late stage bubbles. And Wall Street, I think rather correctly, I believe, actually got quite concerned that this is a sign of a late stage bubble. Uh, you know, we're both old enough to have remembered the dot com boom. Right. And this to me felt extremely familiar. Uh, you know, well, I was remember, gonna say you know, this pet, time pets. is com. different. Individual traders know what they're doing. You know, we're going to change everything. Uh, you know, we can play with options. <laughs> you know, it always ends the same way. Like, generally, there is no new rule under the sun. You're not going to make a fortune doing day trading. Most people eventually lose their shirts sooner or later. And, you know, this is not some, you know, incredible way to take on the man. Um, if you want to take on the man, as I put, pointed out, there are two different ways of doing it. As a political matter, you could argue for tax, substantive tax reform, such as a financial transactions tax, uh, taxing capital gains at the same rate as ordinary income, um, a wealth tax, uh, and so on down the line. These are things that actually objectively scare a lot of billionaires and multimillionaires on Wall Street, as probably well they should. If I had that sort of money, I wouldn't like them either. The other issue, of course, is, you know, a lot of people make money on these sorts of trades. And the really best way to make money in the long haul is to simply put your money in an index fund and get on with your life and not think about this stuff ever again. Yeah, I, I often compare myself and my philosophy, as you know, we have a lot in agreement as the uh, tortoise versus the hare. And the hare is jumping around <laughs> And sometimes gets way ahead and then sometimes stops. But the turtle, just slow and steady. Add 10, 20%, hopefully, to your account. Do it again. Lather, rinse, repeat. Use index funds. Keep your expenses low. Keep your taxes low. And you'll find someday, hopefully, if everything works out well, and I have some clients that have had this experience because we've had two phenomenally successful years where all of a sudden they make more and in a year or sometimes in months than they did working for an entire year. And that, that's a real mind-altering experience. Right. And um, and to be fair, that's going to happen to some of the you know, Robin, Hood, Indeed. Uh, Robin Hood GameStop people. Um, of course, you know, the newspapers are filled with them at the moment and the online sites are filled with them. Because some people did actually cash out at the correct time and, like, use the money to pay off student loans or, you know, put themselves through grad school. I think one paper, I think the Wall Street Journal, but I'm not positive, had that person today. I mean, some people have made, you know, one of the original traders 
a guy who goes by the name of Roaring Kitty, um, cashed out about $13 million. This is clearly life-altering money. Here, yeah. Right? Now, I, I think at least the uh, ongoing information is that he has not cashed out and he's still trying to rally the troops. No, yes, but I believe he cashed out some portion. Ah, excellent. So he's like... He's covered. Hold no matter. I mean, correct. I might be wrong. I mean, but yeah. I think this is what happened. He will be whole and is doing fine no matter what at this point. Well, the, the other... I mean, one other thing I should say yeah. here. There was a lot of talk of gains and losses for people. A lot of this was like paper money. Ah, I was going to say un- unrealized gains and losses. Yes, unrealized gains and unrealized losses. And so the... Um, you know, the um, gains for a lot of people is especially gotten loosey goosey with the gains language, as, as often does with, uh, you know, get rich quick stuff. And, you know, so people say he made 48 million um, or something. And it's like, well, that's paper profit till the day it's sold. Like, yeah. nobody made anything here. Like, it's, you know, it's kind of, um, you know, been a bit of a, you know, a cluster mess that way. I, I had a friend that had uh, dropped the pearl of wisdom that uh, hedge funds have lost fifteen billion, and I pointed out that the stock was collectively worth about two billion. And we're not—I'm mean, ignoring the float. So the the stock, the t- total company was worth two billion, and now it's worth six or seven billion. Uh, walk me through how a hedge fund lost fifteen billion in that process. Uh, and he sent me a link, and unfortunately, the link had. A lot of assumptions, assuming every short was bought at $20 and assuming they didn't have calls to protect themselves, assuming they didn't build straddles uh, mm-hmm. on the way up or have calls uh, to protect because people in hedge funds know that there's an unlimited loss potential with a short so they can take action right. to protect against that. And of course, there's other people, endless numbers of people we don't know about that got wiped out that had five or $10,000 short, just like the hedge funds and couldn't wait for the stock to come back down and they get squeezed out with a margin call. And of course, the people that make all the money when the stock went up and uh, all these options are the really big companies, a lot of them for mutual funds like Fidelity, Vanguard, BlackRock. But there's also a lot of hedge funds that were long on this stock that made a killing uh, selling into the market. And so uh, maybe one or two particular hedge funds lost a billion or more each, but collectively hedge funds ended up ahead because of all the money flying in from new investors, I'll call them. Right. I, I, I mean, yeah, as I said, the whole situation is kind of murky at this point. Yeah. So it, It'll be something, maybe it'll be in your next book. How's that sound? Oh, I hope not. Let somebody else, somebody else can take that. Um, it's, you know, it's, but, you know, it got, sort of got to the point, the last thing I'll say about it is, you know, by Thursday, Friday, my 17 year old was asking about it. And, you know, that's like, and said all his friends everywhere at, at, at Zoom school, uh, you know, at baseball, you know, friends in California, friends in New York, everybody was talking about it. To which my response is this is Joe Kennedy's shoeshine boy moment. This is not a sign you should be investing in anything here right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, when the 17 year old boys on the baseball team know about your stock, Probably not like a power move at that point. Absolutely. Uh, un- if I can shift to a totally different topic, recently you have written about one of my most favorite people in the entire United States government, Katie Porter. Um, and she's been kicked off, apparently, the House Financial Services Committee. Walk us through that and uh, why you might love her almost as much as I do. Well, this is a yet another kind of quasi murky story. Um, Katie Porter, as people, I believe, you know, follow your podcast know, was elected to Congress two years ago from Orange County. She's a former bankrupt. She is a bankruptcy attorney, I should say. She taught at UC Irvine. She was protege of Elizabeth Warren. And she, you know, was just she joins the Financial Services Committee and she's just this kind of, you know, blast of fresh air. Yeah. She brings and brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. She, you know, actually like questions people <laughs> yep. you know, as opposed to the grandstanding that most of these people do um you know she really gets people on the spot she uh gets you know jamie diamond to sort of say you know he doesn't know how people get by on what chase pays their jp morgan chase pays their banking tellers right it's kind of fascinating stuff actually and 
it's um, so you would think somebody would want to leave Katie Porter on the Financial Services Committee when committee reassignments are going through for the new co- session of Congress. And this turns out not to be the case. Um, Katie Porter, it, it, without getting too complex about this, essentially Congress, the House of Representatives, has committees that are considered exclusive and non-exclusive. Um, if you're on an exclusive committee, you need to get waivers to sit on other non-exclusive committees if, and so forth you know, down the line. And essentially, Katie Porter wanted to get a waiver so that she could continue to sit on financial services, which is exclusive, while sitting on oversight, which she was on in the last term as well, which is non-exclusive. And she added another one in, natural resources. And when all of this shook out, what essentially happened is, is she did not get the waiver. And she felt, um, according to you know what was sort of being said and some of her Twitter feeds, that you know this was not right. And I think a lot of people would agree. Um, there has since been reporting that there was tension between her and Maxine Waters, who is the head of the Financial Services Committee, and you know that um, that is part of what happened as well. But, you know, the point of my piece was that, you know, Katie Porter is a real champion for Americans who have trouble with finances and that the powers that be in the Democratic Party in Congress should have stepped in to try to make this work. And that simply did not happen here. Right. Right. Yeah. It's it's a a big thing. Uh, But I've seen several times where she does question people uh, during what do we call those questionings, interrogations? Yeah, question sessions. Question um, sessions. I'm not sure if there's what the proper name is. Yeah, there probably this one. Uh, someone will tell me via email. It's all good. Um, but yeah, she the style of her questions demand real answers, and like you uh, indicated, the one with Jamie Dimon, where she puts people in a corner, and they uh, they are kind of compelled to give an answer that's truthful because to not do so would look crazy, uh, out of out of uh, control. Um, another topic. Uh, unless you want to go back to Katie Porter, which I'm happy to do, is uh, Elizabeth Warren has said she's going to put in the 2% wealth tax. What do you think of that? I think it's something that needs to be discussed, and I think it's something you know that for now is probably not happening. But as I said before, I think it is something that you know is the thing that kind of scares people who are wealthy who invest, right. and I mean you know wealthy investors. I don't mean Reddit board investors. And if somebody wants to stick it to Wall Street, that's a pretty good way of doing it if you're looking to, like, get back at them in some ways, as the GameStop people are claiming. I would say that's probably a much better way than, you know, by trying to to figure out what stocks various hedge funds have shorted and to try to invest in them and do a short squeeze and bring them up. That's the thing that, kind of putting this all together, the thing that really surprised me is that if you think the game is completely rigged, why put money in it? It would be like telling me that you know that you're going to lose money at the casino, so you invite a thousand friends to go with you into the casino, and you just start throwing money around, and then you walk out and say, there, I taught them. It doesn't really work. It didn't do anything. So uh, a fractional penny uh, per share uh, to trade stocks would almost have no effect on the average person, but it would really cramp down, cramp down, clamp down on... uh, you know, uh, automated trades and, and computer generated trades that go through split second. They, they sell and then they buy right back. They buy, they sell, they buy, they sell. Um, that would be at least undermined a little bit with just, you know, a fraction of a percent per share. Um, or actually, the, I think there needs to be regulations on hedge funds in general um, because their ability to make money out of disrupting, destroying economic value uh, through employment and pensions and companies that make things is horrific, in my opinion. Um, I, I would basically agree, and I don't think anybody would notice if it happened. I mean, I mean, I, we, we keep talking about, we keep going back to you know all of this, right, and the GameStop yeah. stuff. But you know, I, I think some of the anger at Wall Street, while legit and real, was kind of an ex post facto explanation for what happened, a sort of justification. I mean, I think most of the GameStop mania was, frankly, a get-rich-quick scheme meets a sort of what I what I've referred to as a like naturally forming pump and dump, you know, like because it's not like I don't believe it was deliberate, but 
or at least at the early stages, I don't believe it was deliberate. Um, God alone knows who's on those boards now, but the, you know, so I, I think like a bunch of different things kind of got confused together in there. Yeah. And, you know, obviously a financial transactions tax would be a very good thing. It would bring in me money that's needed into the system. It would act as a discouragement of, you know, things like high frequency trading of, you know, day trading and stuff like that. Um, it would really, it would sort of be all gain and no loss for the vast majority of people. And I think by definition, that's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, you you jokingly threw it out there before uh, how boring your advice for the average investor is because of index funds. Um, are you still positive index funds? He asks knowingly. Of course. <laughs> I mean, do I think they'll go up this year? I've got no idea. Oh, yeah. What I do know is that your chances of doing better than them are not great. It, it, there's always this idea, and I'm, I'm constantly hit up with this, and I'm sure you are too, where people are like, you know, I went to this broker and he said he could beat the market, or how can I beat the market, or how can I make sure, you know, if the market goes down, I'm not going to lose money. And I'm forever pointing out to people a couple of different things, which is first – that the issue is not simply that you will or won't beat the market. The idea is, is what never seems to occur to people is that the market could go down 10% and your chosen alternative could go down 30%. Like right. they just sort of assume that there's some magical way around this one. Second is that if somebody is telling you the secret, you really got to ask yourself what the heck's going on. <laughs> I'm pretty much assuming, you know, I mean, Hey, if you're Bill Gates listening to this, podcast this doesn't apply to you okay yeah but like you or me or you know most listeners here even somebody with several million dollars like nobody is telling you some great secret that they're not sharing with like you know you know elon musk or bill gates or jeff bezos or or for that matter or just simply hanging out on some yacht off a tax-free caribbean island and not sharing it with anybody and just trading away happily if such a thing even exists. The fact is that if they're telling it to you, by definition, they're making more money telling it to you than they are by this quote secret, and it's probably not such a great secret, and it's probably not really helpful or truthful. Well, uh, as an example of all that, just coincidentally, one of my listeners sent me a link to a hour-long video with Sarah Palin promoting a investor, and they claim that he has made three to ten times uh, the money on every stock that he's picked the last 42 or 48 times that he's done it. And right. I, I'm thinking, first of all, this sounds a lot like testimonials and those could be illegal depending on your registration status. Um, but again, if, if he's making a lot of money on these $100 uh, packets that he sells to you, these subscriptions, um, uh, Maybe, maybe, maybe he's trying to help the world. I, I guess that, that could be possible. He has all the money that he wants, and now he's going to share. Uh, I don't know. It was, uh, it was harsh to uh, watch Sarah Palin attempt to act. It was kind of comical. Yeah, it's, it's clearly, you know, I, you know, I guess what I would say is you need to be very, very cautious in these sorts of circumstances. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if I my last forty eight stocks were really great picks. I'm not so sure I'd be trying to market that ability. Like, <laughs> I might be busy researching my 49th. Like, yeah. yeah. It's an interesting thing. Uh, anything else you want to throw in or talk about before we wrap up and let you go back to actual doing real work? No, I think we're, we've covered it. We've been on almost a half hour, so Excellent. I don't want to keep you either. But well, thank you for having me on. It is my pleasure. And, of course, listeners, Helene Olin, a couple of her books, Pound Foolish, The Index Card, uh, you write for the Washington Post. And again, thank you so much for coming on The Phil Ferguson Show. Thank you for having me on. Jesus had a tough life. Boy. I read about that guy. Jesus is the only guy that ever came back from the dead that didn't scare the fuck out of everybody, man. <laughs> He's the only guy that ever crawled out of a grave where people didn't go, oh, oh! Jesus 
Chris comes back, he doesn't get any pressure. No static, nobody's upset. He climbs out, he's walking around, nobody's upset. They can eat with him and everything, <laughs> you know. It's like, isn't that guy dead? Yeah, but he's real stubborn, man. He won't accept it. <laughs> Pass the butter. But... <laughs> what are they staring at? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, I read it, folks. I read that book. He's on the cross. There's 30, 40 Christians standing around going, it's a shame that he has to die. And Jesus is going, well, maybe I wouldn't have to. Somebody get a ladder and a pair of tires. I don't know if Jesus has actually spoken in an audible voice to anybody in about 2,000 years. Folks. I think his last words may have been, Oh, ah! Oh, not the other! Oh, you jerk! Oh. It may have been his last words. I'm not sure. Yeah. People say, you think Jesus is coming back? Sure. Sure. What's it been? What's it been? Two thousand years? Boy, I sure don't want to dampen anybody's optimism here. It's only two thousand fucking years. Yeah, he's coming back. He's gonna do game shows. We're gonna go, Jesus. This is your life. Remember this noise. Yeah. All right, don't tell me. Don't tell me. Give me a second. He's up in heaven right now. They're going, why don't you go back down to earth? Be a symbol of peace and love to the world. Help. He's going, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Help, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to help. Tell him I'll be there as soon as I can play the piano again. Thanks a lot. I mean, the only shame that can use his hand is a fucking Again, a special thanks to John McNair and Helene Olin for being on the show. Um, I think what I'm going to do in reference to GameStop at this point is I'm done. I'm done with GameStop. Uh, talked about it here twice. We did have uh, in the previous full episode uh, a special segment about shorts and versus long that was planned before the GameStop thing uh, became the phenomenon that it was. Where it plays out, I don't know. I mean, if something really big or material happens, I might mention it. But you got the idea. If you want to hear me talk about it more, um, Seth Andrews and I did a video on YouTube with, with his show, The Thinking Atheist. You can uh, hear it there. And uh, Serious Inquiries Only podcast with uh, Thomas Thomas Smith. Uh you can go hear more of my thoughts there. And, you know, if anyone else has a, a YouTube or a podcast, if they want to talk about it, that's cool. I'm just kind of done with it here. Um, so I'm going to move on to other fun things like educational stuff. I already have three more interviews uh, scheduled in the next couple of days. Uh, so some of those, of course, might take a week or two or three to get out. But a lot of good stuff. I think you're going to keep liking it all. Um if you want to get updates uh, to some of my thoughts before others, you can, of course, go to patreon.com slash fill uh, and become a patron there. The other thing that you can do to help me out a little bit is share the show. Tell one friend, tell two friends, and tell them to tell two friends, and we'll see what happens. Um, I greatly appreciate that. It looks like the last show uh, might have been the most downloaded show in quite some time, uh, maybe even a year or two so yay i'm glad everyone uh liked that and maybe we have some new listeners this week so i appreciate you being there and uh, you know hopefully we can go outside and meet other people like normal sometime before 2021 is over and i hope to see you out there somewhere soon until then ciao